Sin's Complete Fairy Tales book. I hope you enjoy. The first one is called The Tallow Candle, and this is from the 1820s. There was sputtering and sizzling as the flames played under the pan. This was the tallow candle's cradle, and out of the warm cradle slipped the candle, perfectly shaped, all of a piece, shiny white and slender. It was formed in a way that made everyone who laid eyes on it believe that it must promise a bright and glorious future. Indeed, it was destined to keep that promise and fulfil their expectations. The sheep, a pretty little sheep, was the candle's mother, and the melting pot was its father. From its mother it had inherited its dazzling white body, an intuitive understanding of life, but from its father it had acquired the desire for the blazing fire that would eventually reach its very core and shine the light for it in life. That is how it had been made and how it cast itself, with the best and brightest of hopes into life. Here it met an amazing number of fellow creatures with whom it had dealings, since it desired to get to know life and thus perhaps find the most suitable niche for itself. But the candle saw the world in too benevolent a light, while the world only cared about itself and not about the tallow candle at all. The world was unable to understand the true nature of the candle, so it tried to use it to its own advantage and handle the candle improperly. Black fingers made bigger and bigger spots on the white colour of innocence, which little by little totally disappeared covered with the filth of an outside world that had been far too harsh and come much closer than the candle could bear, since it had been unable to distinguish between the pure and the impure, but deep inside it was still innocent and unspoiled. That is when the false friends realised that they could not reach its innermost part. In anger they threw away the candle, considering it a useless thing. The outer black layer kept away everybody good. They were afraid of becoming contaminated by the black colour, of getting spots on themselves, so they kept a distance. Now the poor tallow candle was lonely, abandoned, and at its wit's end. It felt cast off by what was good, and discovered that it had been nothing but a blind door, used to advance what was bad. It felt so terribly sad, because it had lived its life without purpose. Perhaps it had even tarnished some good things by its presence. It could not grasp why and to what end it had been created, why it was put on this earth where it might destroy itself and even others. More and more, increasingly deeply, it bonded the situation, but the more it thought, the greater its despondency, since it could not find anything good at all, no real meaning for itself, or see the purpose it had been given at birth. It was as if the black layer had also thrown a veil over its eyes. That was when it met a small flame, a tinderbox. The tinderbox knew the light better than the tallow candle knew itself, for the tinderbox saw everything so clearly, right through the outer layer, and inside it found so much good. Therefore it went closer, and bright hopes emerged in the candle. It lit up and its heart melted. The flame shone brightly, like a wedding torch of joy. Everything became bright and clear, and it showed the way for those in its company its true friends, and helped by the light they could now successfully seek truth. The body too was strong enough to nurture and support the burning flame. Like the beginnings of new life, one round and plump drop after the other rolled down the candle, covering the filth of the past. This was not only the bodily, but also the spiritual gain of the marriage. The tallow candle had found its true place in life, and proved that a true light shone for a long time spreading joy for itself and its fellow creatures. No idea what that was meant to me. I never do with these stories. <laughs> the next one is called The Tinderbox, and this is from 1835. There came a soldier marching down the high road. One, two, one, two. He had his knapsack on his back and his sword at his side as he came home from the wars. On the road he met a witch, an ugly old witch, a witch whose lower lip right down on her chest. Good evening, soldier, she said. What a fine sword you've got there, and what a big knapsack. Aren't you every inch a soldier? And now you shall have money, as much as you please. That's very kind, you old witch, said the soldier. See that big tree, the witch pointed to one nearby them. It's hollow to the roots. Climb to the top of the trunk, and you'll find a hole through which you can let yourself down, deep under the tree. I'll tie a rope around your middle, so that when you call me, I can pull you up again. What would I do deep down under that tree? The soldier wanted to know. Fetch money, the witch said. Listen, when you touch bottom, you'll find yourself in a great hall. It's very bright there, because more than a hundred lamps 
large chest in the middle of the floor. On it sits a dog, and his eyes are as big as saucers. But don't worry about that. I'll give you my blue checked apron to spread out on the floor. Snatch up that dog and set him on my apron. Then you can open the chest and take out as many pieces of money as you please. They are all copper. If silver suits you better, then go into the next room. There sits a dog, and his eyes are as big as mill wheels. But don't you care about that? Set the dog on my apron while you line your pockets with silver. Maybe you'd rather have gold. You can, you know. You can have all the gold you can carry if you go into the third room. The only hitch is that there on the money chest sits a dog, and each of his eyes is as big as the round tower of Copenhagen. That's the sort of dog he is. But never you mind how fierce he looks. Just set him on my apron and he'll do you no harm as you help yourself from the chest to all the gold you want. That suits me, said the soldier. But what do you get out of all of this, you old witch? I suppose that you want your share. No indeed, said the witch. I don't want a penny of it. All I ask is for you to fetch me an old tinderbox that my grandmother forgot the last time she was down there. Good, said the soldier. Tie the rope around me. Here it is, said the witch, and here's my blue jacket apron. The soldier climbed up to the hole in the tree and let himself slide through it. Feet foremost down into the great hall, where the hundreds of lamps were burning, just as the witch had said. Now he threw open the first door he came to. Ugh, oh, there sat a dog, glaring at him with eyes as big as saucers. You're a nice fellow, the soldier said, as he shifted him to the witch's apron and took all the coppers that his pockets would hold. He shut up the chest, set the dog back on it, and made for the second room. Alas and alack, there sat the dog with eyes as big as mill wheels. Don't you look at me like that, the soldier set him on the witch's apron. You're apt to strain your eyesight. When he saw the chest brimful of silver, he threw away all his coppers and filled both his pockets and knapsack with silver alone. Then he went into the third room. Oh, what a horrible sight to see. The dog in there really did have eyes as big as the round tower and when he rolled them they spun like wheels. Good evening, the soldier said, and saluted, for such a dog he had never seen before. But on second glance he thought to himself, this won't do. So he lifted the dog down to the floor and threw open the chest. What a sight! It was gold and to spare. He could buy out all Copenhagen with it. He could buy all the cake women's sugar pigs, and all the tin soldiers, whips and rocking horses that are in the world. Yes, there was really money. In short order, the soldier got rid of all the silver coins he had stuffed in his pockets and knapsack to put gold in their place. Yes, sir, he crammed all his pockets, his knapsack, his cap and his boots so full that he scarcely could walk. Now he was made of money. Putting the dog back on the chest, he banged out the door and called up through the hollow tree. Pull me up now, you old witch. Have you got the tinderbox? asked the witch. Confound the tinderbox, the soldier shouted. I clean forgot it. When he fetched it, the witch hauled him up. There he stood on the high road again, with his pockets, boots, knapsack, and cap full of gold. What do you want with the tinderbox? he asked the old witch. None of your business, she told him. You've had your money, so hand over my tinderbox. Nonsense, said the soldier. I'll take out my sword, and I'll cut your head off if you don't tell me at once what you want with it. I won't, the witch screamed at him. So he cut her head off. There she lay, but he tied all his money in her apron slung it over his shoulder, stuck the tinderbox in his pocket, and struck out for town. It was a splendid town. He took the best rooms at the best inn, and ordered all the good things he liked to eat, for he was a rich man now, because he had so much money. The servant who cleaned his boots may have thought them remarkably well worn for a man of such means, but that was before he went shopping. Next morning, he brought boots worthy of him, and the best clothes. Now that he had turned out to be such a fashionable gentleman, people told him all about the splendours of their town, all about their king, and what a pretty princess he had for a daughter. Where can I see her? The soldier inquired. You can't see her at all, everyone said. She lives in a great copper castle, inside all sorts of walls and towers. Only the king can come in or go out of it, for it's been foretold that the princess will marry a common soldier. The king would much rather she didn't. I'd like to see her just the same, the soldier thought, but there was no way to manage it. Now he lived a merry life. He went to the theatre, drove about in the king's garden, and gave away money to poor people. This was to his credit, for he remembered from the old days what
what it feels like to go without a penny in your pocket. Now that he was wealthy and well-dressed, he had all too many who called him their friend and a genuine gentleman. That pleased him. But he spent money every day without making any, and wound up with only two coppers to his name. He had to quit his fine quarters to live in a garret, clean his own boots, and mend them himself with a darning needle. None of his friends came to see him, because there were too many stairs to climb. One evening, when he sat in the dark without even enough money to buy a candle, he suddenly remembered there was a candle end in the tinderbox he had picked up when the witch sent him down to the hollow tree. He got out the tinderbox, and the moment he struck sparks from the flint of it, his door burst open, and there stood a dog from down under the tree. It was the one with the eyes as big as saucers. What, said the dog, is my lord's command? What's this, said the soldier? Have I got the sort of tinderbox that will get me whatever I want? Go get me some money, he ordered the dog. Zip, the dog was gone. Zip, he was back again, with a bag full of copper in his mouth. Now the soldier knew what a remarkable tinderbox he had. Strike it once, and there was a dog from the chest of copper coins. Strike it twice, and here came the dog who had the silver. Three times brought the dog who guarded gold. Back went the soldier to his comfortable quarters. Out strode the soldier in fashionable clothes. Immediately his friends knew him again because they liked him so much. Then the thought occurred to him, isn't it odd that no one ever gets to see the princess? They say she's very pretty, but what's the good of it as long as she stays locked up in that large copper castle with so many towers? Why can't I see her? Where's my tinderbox? He struck a light and Zip became the dog with eyes as big as saucers. It certainly is late, said the soldier, practically midnight. But I do want a glimpse of the princess, if only for a moment. Out the door went the dog, and before the soldier could believe it, here came the dog with the princess on his back. She was sound asleep, and so pretty that everyone could see she was a princess. The soldier couldn't keep from kissing her, because he was every inch a soldier. Then the dog took the princess home. Was she still asleep? Gross. Next morning, when the king and queen were drinking their tea, the princess told them about the strange dream she'd had all about a dog and a soldier. She'd ridden on the dog's back, and the soldier had kissed her. Now that was a fine story, said the queen. The next night, one of the old ladies of the court was under orders to sit by the princess's bed, and see whether this was a dream or something else altogether. The soldier was longing to see the pretty princess again, so the dog came by night to take her up and away as fast as he could run. But the old lady pulled on her storm boots and ran right after them. When she saw them disappear into a large house, she thought, Now I know where it is, and drew a big cross on the door with a piece of chalk. Then she went home to bed, and before long the dog brought the princess home too. But when the dog saw that cross marked on the soldier's front door, he got himself a piece of chalk and cross marked every door in the town. This was a clever thing to do, because now the old lady couldn't tell the right door from all the wrong doors he had marked. Early in the morning, along came the king and the queen, the old lady and all the officers to see where the princess had been. Here it is, said the king, when he saw the first cross mark. No, my dear, there it is, said the queen, who was looking next door. Here's one, there's one, and yonder's another one, said they all. Wherever they looked, they saw chalk marks, so they gave up searching. The queen, though, was an uncommonly clever woman, who could do more than ride in a coach. She took her big gold scissors, cut out a piece of silk, and made a neat little bag. She filled it with fine buckwheat flour and tied it onto the princess's back. Then she pricked a little hole in it so that the flour would sift out along the way, wherever the princess might go. Again the dog came in the night, took the princess on his back, and ran with her to the soldier, who loved her so much that he would have been glad to be a prince just so he could make her his wife. The dog didn't notice how the flour made a trail from the castle right up to the soldier's window, where he ran up the wall with the princess. So in the morning, it was all too plain to the king and queen just where their daughter had been. They took the soldier and they put him in prison. There he sat. It was dark and it was dismal, and they told him, Tomorrow is the day for you, Tang. That didn't cheer him up any, and as for his tinderbox, he'd left it behind at the inn. In the morning, he could see through his narrow little window how the people 
custom was to grant a poor criminal one last small favour. He wanted to smoke a pipe of tobacco, the last he'd be smoking in this world. The king couldn't refuse this, so the soldier struck fire from his tinderbox, once, twice, and a third time. Zip thirsted all the dogs, one with eyes as big as saucers, one with eyes as big as mill wheels, one with eyes as big as the round tower of Copenhagen. Help me, save me from hanging said the soldier. Those dogs took the judges and all the council, some by the leg and some by the nose, and tossed them so high that they came down broken to bits. Don't cry the king, but the biggest dog took him and the queen too, and tossed them up after the others. Then the soldiers trembled and the people shouted, Soldier, be our king, and marry the pretty princess. So they put the soldier in the king's carriage. All three of his dogs danced in front of it and shouted, Hurrah! The boys whistled through their fingers, and the soldiers saluted. The princess came out of the copper castle to be queen, and that suited her exactly. The wedding lasted all of a week, and the three dogs sat at the table, with their eyes opened wider than ever before. The next one is The Princess on the Bee, from 1835. Once there was a prince who wanted to marry a princess, only a real one would do. So he travelled through all the world to find her, and everywhere things went wrong. There were princesses aplenty, but how was he to know whether they were real princesses? There was something not quite right about them all, so he came home again and was unhappy, because he did so want to have a real princess. One evening, a terrible storm blew up. It lightened and thundered and rained. It was really frightful. In the midst of it all came a knocking at the town gate. The old king went to open it. Who should be standing outside but a princess, and what a sight she was in all that rain and wind. Water streamed from her hair, down her clothes, into her shoes, and ran out at the heels. Yet she claimed to be a real princess. We'll soon find that out, the old queen thought to herself. Without saying a word about it, she went to the bedchamber, stripped back the bedclothes, and put just one bee in the bottom of the bed. Then she took twenty mattresses and piled them on the bee. Then she took twenty eiderdown feather beds and piled them on the mattresses. Up on top of all these, the princess was to spend the night. In the morning they asked her, did you sleep well? Oh, said the princess, no, I scarcely slept at all. Heaven knows what's in that bed. I lay on something so hard that I'm black and blue all over. It was simply terrible. They could see she was a real princess, and no question about it, now that she had felt one bee all the way through twenty mattresses and twenty more feather beds. Nobody but a princess could be so delicate. So the prince made haste to marry her, because he knew he had found a real princess. As for the bee, they put it in the museum. There it's still to be seen, unless somebody has taken it. There, that's a true story. The last one I'll read for this video is called The Naughty Boy, and this is also from 1835. Once upon a time there was an old poet, one of those good, honest old poets. One evening, as he was sitting quietly in his home, a terrible storm broke out. The rain poured down in torrent, but the old poet sat warm and cosy in his study, for a fire blazed brightly in his stove, and roasting apples sizzled and hissed beside it. There won't be a dry stitch on anybody out in this rain, he told himself. You see, he was a very kind-hearted old poet. Oh, please open the door for me. I'm so cold and wet, cried a little child outside his house. Then it knocked at the door, while the rain poured down and the wind shook all the windows. Why, the poor little child, cried the old poet, as he hurried to open the door. Before him stood a naked little boy, with the water streaming down from his yellow hair. He was shivering and would certainly have perished in the storm had he not been let in. Yes, poor little fellow, said the poet again and took him by the hand. Come in and we'll soon have you warmed up. I shall give you some wine and a roasted apple, for you're such a pretty little boy. And he really was pretty. His eyes sparkled like two bright stars and his hair hung in lovely curls, even though the water was still streaming from it. He looked like a little angel. He was pale with the cold and shivering in every limb. In his hand he held a beautiful little bow and arrow set, but the bow had been ruined by the rain, and all the colours on the arrows had run together. The old poet quickly sat down by the 
is shining. Yes, the old poet said, but I'm afraid the rain has spoiled your bow. That would be a shame, replied the little boy, as he looked the bow over carefully. No, it's already dry again, and the string is good and tight. No damage done. I guess I'll try it. Then he fitted an arrow to his bow, aimed it, and shot the good old poet right through the heart. Do you see now that my bow is not spoiled, he said laughingly, and ran out of the house. Wasn't he a naughty boy to shoot the good old poet who had been so kind to him, taking him into his warm room and giving him delicious wine and his best apple? The good poet lay on the floor and wept, because he really had been shot right through the heart. What a naughty boy that Cupid is, he cried. I must warn all the good children, so that they will be careful and never play with him, because he will certainly do them some harm. So he warned all the good children, and they were very careful to keep away from that naughty Cupid. But he is very clever, and he tricks them all the time. When the students are going home from the lectures, he runs beside them with a black coat on and a book under his arm. They don't recognise him, but they take his arm, thinking he is a student too and then he sends his arrows into their hearts. And when the girls are in church to be confirmed, he is likely to catch them and shoot his darts into them. Yes, he is always after people. In the theatre, he sits up in the big chandelier, burning so brightly that people think he's a lamp, but they soon find out better. He runs about the king's garden and on the rampart, and once he even shot your father and mother right through the heart. Just ask them and you'll hear what they say. Yes, he's a bad boy, this Cupid. You had better never have anything to do with him, for he is after all of you. And what do you think? A long time ago, he even shot an arrow into your poor old grandmother. The wound is healed up, but she will never forget it. Saucy Cupid. But now you know all about him and what a naughty boy he is. <laughs> that was weird.